Morning, church. Um, the readings I'll do are from the Amplified version of the Bible. So uh, the Gospels of Mark and Matthew both describe the crucifixion scene of Jesus as people passing by hurling abuse at him. If you are the King of Israel, let him come down and we will believe him and acknowledge him. Robbers who were crucified with him also began to insult him in the same way. The Gentile author, Luke, also notes rulers and soldiers sneered at Jesus. And in verse 39 describes one of the criminals who had hanged on a cross kept, kept hurling abuse at him. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other, the other robber rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We are suffering justly because we are getting what we deserve for what we have done. But this man, capital M, this man, has done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, I assure you, this is while he's dying on the cross, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, today, today, you will be with me in paradise. So when I read Luke's account, I wonder what did the robber see or discern that changed his mind and his behaviour about who Jesus is at the time of their crucifixion? Jewish elders, soldiers, passers-by were abusing Jesus, saying, if you, if you come down off the cross, then we will believe. So perform first and then I will have faith. But this man, no, for he said he is a son of God. But Jesus didn't have to come down off the cross for that robber to believe in him or who he said he is. In fact, he watched Jesus suffering too. In Isaiah, a well-known scripture about Jesus' death recorded in the Old Testament or prophesied in the Old Testament says, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our wickedness. The punishment for our well-being fell on him and by his stripes or his wounds, we are healed. So Jesus was abandoned by those who had been following him. He was alone, he was grieving, he was rejected by his countrymen, he was mocked by the community, he was betrayed by those he called friends and also the governing processes at the time. He also had been tortured before the crucifixion and the crucifixion was a death for rebels and criminals and usually the less powerful in society very rare for a Roman citizen to be crucified. On average, it took three days to die from crucifixion, which is why the soldiers broke the legs. So because you're suffocating when you're being crucified, you would press on your legs to try and get breath. Jesus, however, died after six hours as he surrendered his own spirit. As I understand it, that would have been very challenging. I imagine it would have been very difficult to talk, yet talk Jesus did when he assured the fellow that he's coming. And talk the robber did when he said, stop it to the other robber who was abusing him. The robbers knew who Jesus was, either by accusation, because it was written above the cross where he was nailed, or by reputation. Perhaps they were Jewish themselves, I do not know. But they're saying to him, are you not the Christ? So they're aware that this is the Saviour, the Messiah. They're aware of that is the accusation. Yet this one robber disapproved of the other's continued abuse of Jesus and told him so. And I can't help but wonder if when he saw Jesus as the Christ, in that very same moment, he saw himself or themselves, because he says, we are getting what we deserve for what we have done. And he asked Jesus very clearly to remember him when, not if, when he comes into his kingdom. He believed him. He believed him at the time of crucifixion. To me, that's quite a statement of faith 
at that time in history, acknowledging God's kingdom will come while the Christ, the Saviour, is on the cross. So if you think of the scene at the time, the New Testament hadn't been written, would it, what would it look like? Would Jesus have looked victorious to the onlookers? And what was Jesus' reply? Today, I love that, today, today we have the kingdom. Today you will be with me in the garden. He believed Jesus in the midst of all of that suffering. So the gospel writers also describe Jesus forgave from the cross and he spoke to John about the care of his mother. Isaiah says he did not open his mouth to complain or defend himself. A robber by definition takes from others and I wonder if he saw his own nature and his own behaviour. In contrast to the character of God, Jesus' behaviour, suffering on the cross. And we can trust him because he didn't get down off that cross. So when I take communion, communion, elements, I remember we were brought at a price for sin, 1 Corinthians. And so as I take this, oh, Venice over it. Thank you. So as we take the elements, let's take them together. And I'd like to pray, Heavenly Father, I pray, may we see Jesus for who he is. Amen. I just want to pray before I bring the word this morning. So, um, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that already, Lord, you have reminded us of why we're able to be here. That you've made a way when you sent Jesus, your Son, to die on our behalf. And just as that thief knew in his own heart, we also know that, you know, it's us that we deserve, we deserve what Jesus took for us. So Lord, um, I pray that that understanding and revelation, Lord God, just goes deep within us today. I pray over this word that I have to bring, Lord God, and I believe that this is you know, you're just you're saying to us, that this is a brand new day. It's a brand new day. There are new and fresh things for us today. And I pray that Holy Spirit, you would move upon these words. And even it's, it goes way beyond even the words that are spoken, but you actually move in our hearts and our lives. I pray, Lord, over our giving um, as we sow in, and, you know, plant seed into the, into the kingdom of God, that you would breathe upon that and, and bring it to life. And uh, Lord, the finances that we, that we sow are purposeful and we purpose in our hearts, Lord God, what we give, how we give. Um, and it's, in our, it's from a place of our heart that we do that. So thank you, Lord. Breathe upon our, our finances, Lord God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. thinking back to um, last week's message and uh, every time I think about John's message, uh, it makes me smile. Uh, and I smile because the kingdom of God is so, um, you know, and who we are in Christ is so completely different and foreign to the ways of the natural world that we live in. And I keep hearing John say, I love myself. <laughs> I love myself, and, um, and it makes me laugh. It does make me laugh, not in a mocking way at all, but in, with joy. Um, because our old, our old carnal nature and our old way of thinking would hear that statement um, as pride and probably even arrogance. But as, as sons and daughters of God, you know, a people who have given our lives over to Christ, to Jesus, where it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, 
then to say that I love myself is actually a statement of true humility. Humility is about truth. And I love, I love who I am in Christ. I love that my life is Christ's. And I love that, uh, what the grace of God has done and will continue to do throughout all of our lives. Jesus said the two greatest commandments are to love God with all our heart and to love others as we love ourselves. And if we really want to love others the way God called us to, then we need to love ourselves. And when we, that, when we truly get that first, first one right, loving God heartedly, and in return then, of course, knowing his love for us, then the second one becomes a whole lot easier. I can love myself and love others when I know how much I am truly loved. Unfortunately, the opposite is also true. Self-hatred and self-rejection have led many people to live lives of uh, destruction, rebellion, and a disregard for others. And I, also, I say, you know, having said that, I also say, there but by the grace of God go I. Because who knows what environmental, social, family factors have contributed to a person's story. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we watched a, a video clip about Crossroads Prison Ministry. And uh, some of you responded to see how you, you could get involved with that ministry, which, which was really great. Um, Philip um, passed on to me this week uh, a newsletter that came from Crossroads, and it, it included this little story. Um, it says, Prison Chaplain Dan Evers wrote of how a group of offenders in maximum security, okay, they're in maximum security, at Goldman Correctional Centre, had taken the initiative to gather each day to share from the Bible and pray together in their prison yard. It started as a couple of men and grew to around 20 to 30. And in Dan's own, own words, he says, as a result, there has been a large increase in demand for Bibles in the jail. These inmates are extremely hungry to read and to study God's word. And many of them um, also signed up for the Crossroads and Emmaus Bible study correspondence courses. These men, men are publicly unashamed of their faith and it is having quite an impact on the rest of the jail. Many officers and fellow inmates have, have been taking notice. Some have stated that they have not witnessed a spiritual awakening like this in a jail before. A direct correlation seems to be that there is a reduction in, of incidents in this part of the jail. Lives are truly being transformed for good, and this has been nothing short of a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that incredible? <clears throat> and I pray that these men receive the revelation of how much God loves them and loves them as a father. I just really believe this is a, a missing gap in a lot of people's lives who struggle and end up in, um, in these kind of situations. It's the love of a father that they really need and hunger for. And so in turn, that they will then be able to begin to love others as they love themselves. And I also love that last statement that the chaplain made. He said, uh, this has been nothing short of the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. And this is the jumping board for me, uh, for us, into what I feel that God is wanting to say to us as Seacoast Church this morning. In some ways, it is a call back to, to our first love, um, our first passion for God, and the, you know, that awakening in our own lives, a uh, fanning of the coals of our own hearts so that, we burst, that they, they burst into flame again. But I believe that there is a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit that he wants to accomplish through us as well. We've been uh, believing for revival for a long time. We've been praying and standing and prophesying that there would be a miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And, and that many, many people 
uh, would, come, would be saved and healed and delivered and experience the freedom that comes from knowing Christ. Freedom to love God, to love others as they love themselves. And I really believe that, we, that this, it is so close. We've been, we've been bordering on the edges of that vision for some time. And we're not alone in that. I, I know um, many INC churches and other denominations are sensing that exactly that same thing. But in the waiting, in that waiting, there is a danger that our passion and our expectancy can come under attack. Things like apathy, uh, familiarity, discouragement, uh, complacency can creep in. And if we are not careful, we can begin to lose heart. We can even get blinded to what the Holy Spirit actually is doing uh, in our midst. So this is our scripture for this morning. And it comes from the cry of David's heart. In Psalm 92.10, in the Passion Translation, it says, Your anointing has made me strong and mighty. You've empowered my life for triumph by pouring fresh oil over me. So this morning, I'm going to be praying for all of us for an outpouring of fresh oil, a fresh anointing to lift us up again and to strengthen us and empower us to remain steadfast in our faith, to be steadfast in continually holding up that vision of revival for our own lives, for the church and for our nation. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit himself would come and do spiritually what they used to do in the Old Testament and smear oil all over us. To be anointed actually means to have oil smeared or rubbed onto a person as as they are set apart for the work of God. And David had that happen to him uh, when he was actually still uh, a very young boy. The prophet Samuel was called by God to to anoint one of the sons of Jesse. And um, Samuel wasn't, he didn't know at the time, you know, which son that would be, Um, but to anoint one of Jesse's sons as king of Israel. And so Jesse lined them all up and actually, actually did, there wasn't quite all of them, um, beginning with the eldest. And in 1 Samuel 6, 16, 6 to 7, it says, So it was when they came uh, that he looked at Eliab, the eldest, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not look as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I've come to realise that this statement not only applies to those who outwardly look um, perfect, you know, the perfect part, but to those who, who also look the least likely to be sought by God. For God always looks beyond the outer. He cares only for the heart. In verse 10, it says, Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he, till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And I love uh, the fact that when they did anoint people with oil, they didn't do what we, we do. We just get a little dab and put it on your forehead. They get the whole oil, a horn, a horn of oil, and pour it out all over the person, just making sure the job's done properly. But I wanted to share that little story uh, this morning because it's important to understand that this is the first time that David was anointed for the call of God upon his life. And um, if you have surrendered your life, to Christ and invited the Holy Spirit into your life, 
then you are also anointed to fulfill the destiny that He has for you. However, life, life has its seasons. It has its battles. And we can get weary and discouraged as we continue to believe and to uphold the vision that God has given us, especially when we see the enemy find his way into our health, our, our finances, our businesses, our relationships. And fighting the good fight of faith can wear us down. It's in the midst of talking about his enemies that David speaks, uh, he speaks out this revelation from Psalm 92, that the anointing has made him strong and mighty and that there has been, he has been empowered uh, for triumph by having fresh oil, fresh oil poured out over him. Church, you may be anointed, but there is always the opportunity to be anointed with fresh oil. Sometimes you just need something new and fresh to be imparted to your life. In fact, it seems that an anointing, an anointing that we had, you know, for previous victories, for previous accomplishments, may not be the same anointing we need for the future and, and, the, and the future callings upon our lives. Fresh anointings require, um, a, fr sorry, fresh opportunities require a fresh anointing. New battles require a fresh anointing. And remember, I'm not just talking about battles from the outside. Sometimes the battles are from within. Our own rebellious attitudes, our own stubborn mindsets, our own failing trust, our own apathy and discouragement. Sometimes the biggest battles come from within. Sometimes we lose heart. And for some, we can lose heart because, you know, we're getting older. We feel our physical strength and ability isn't what it was. But Paul speaks about having the spirit of faith. And he says in 2 Corinthians 4.16, Therefore do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Yeah. I'm glad... <clears throat> so there's a newness, there's a newness to our inner man every day, no matter what our physical body is doing or how old we are, God is into newness of life and spiritual, fresh spiritual life day after day. Lamentations 2, 20, uh, sorry, Lamentations 3, 22 to 23 says, Though the Lord's mercies, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The mercy of God is new and fresh every morning. Today, this morning, Kim was talking about, you know, Jesus said today. There's something about today. And the fresh mercies of God are here for us today, this morning. I came across um, also this really interesting scripture from the prophet Isaiah. And uh, he had a fearful vision of impending, uh, impending battle. In Isaiah 21, 2 to 5, it says, A distressing vision is declared to me. The treacherous dealer deals treacherously, and the plunderer plunders. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O media, all its sighing I have made to cease. Therefore my loins are filled with pain, pangs have taken hold of me like the pangs of a woman in labour. I was distressed when I heard it and I was dismayed when I saw it. My heart wavered, fearfulness frightened me. The night for which I longed, he turned into fear for me. Pretty heavy duty vision that um, Isaiah has here. But you know, I just think perhaps this is speaking to someone here this morning. Fear is making your heart waver. There's a sense of dread that you are battling, what you are, you know, having to battle in your own personal life right now. And some kind of distress has come around you. But David goes on and says this in verse 5. Or, sorry, um, Isaiah says, Prepare the table, 
set a watchman in the tower, eat and drink, arise, you princes, anoint the shield. Now that says to me, get up, have others stand with you and take watch with you and over you. Have something to eat, get your physical strength, regain your physical strength and then anoint your shield. Is God saying to you today, anoint your shield, pour fresh anointing oil on your shield. And what is your shield? Well, over in Ephesians 6.16, it says, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Is God saying to you this morning, your shield, uh, your, your shield of faith needs a fresh anointing? In Old Testament times, they would pour oil on their shields as they prepared for battle so that the arrows and the darts of the enemy would just slide off. I didn't know that. I only found, read that this week. Perhaps your shield needs a good oiling. Your faith has become a bit dry. Your faith needs the oil of the Holy Spirit, a fresh anointing. In another place, it says in Isaiah 27, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your back and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. I see too many yokes and burdens on people's lives. They're real. They weigh you down. They rob our joy. What burdens are you carrying this morning? Perhaps there, there, there are... There's, there are burdens and yokes that you carry that are obvious to other people. Or maybe there are burdens that you carry in your heart that nobody else even knows about. The devil just wants to do whatever it takes to stop the flow of the anointing upon your life. Because the anointing is God's presence and power to accomplish the supernatural, to accomplish life-changing destiny, and to break off the yokes that the enemy has placed upon your shoulders. This morning we're going to pray for that fresh anointing oil of the Spirit to lift those burdens and yokes from your shoulders, from, from your heart, from your mind. Not yesterday's presence and power, but today's fresh anointing. This morning's new and fresh mercies that break and destroy every yoke. We have our Saviour, Jesus, who, who proclaimed um, the prophecy that Isaiah originally spoke out. It was spoken out over 700 years before Jesus was born, but it was speaking of Jesus, the Messiah. And in Luke 4, 18 to 19, Je Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. We have that same spirit of the Lord, that same resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. And I love what Stephanie said uh, as she was sharing communion last week. She said that it's that same power that rolled that stone away from that grave. Um, and, and Jesus um, came forth alive. So the end of the step, you know, everything that um, Kim was sharing this morning, so real for us and, 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 and saved our lives. But the story continues on and, the, and Jesus rose three days later. So we have that same spirit. We are anointed to preach the gospel, to heal the broken, to see people set free, to, to heal the blind, the deaf, the oppressed. The Word is true. The Word of God is true. I trust the Word of God far more than I trust my own past experience. I trust the anointing far more than I trust my own natural ability. Together as the body of Christ, His church, we can position ourselves with one heart and one spirit in such a place of unity that God will release His blessing. Not only release it, but command that blessing to come. And again, from David, a psalm that we all know very well. 
But let me speak it out again today because it is powerful. Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil, that precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Just imagine that fresh oil freely flowing down over Aaron, but, how, but now imagine it flowing freely down over our lives together as well. It says in verse 3, It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. If you want a fresh anointing upon your life and for God's blessing to be released upon His church, then allow the Holy Spirit to convict your heart of anything that would bring potential disunity. Negativity in any way, disharmony amongst the brothers and your brothers and sisters in Christ. Lift off all judgments, criticism, misunderstandings, speaking unkind words. Check your heart for pride, envy, anything that would place a wedge within the body of Christ. And pray for those who have hurt you, offended you, misunderstood you, or judged you. That's what breaks the power of burdens and yokes. See that fresh, precious anointing oil running down over the whole body, the whole church, every person. There is no room for even the slightest bit of division amongst us. Refreshing will come when repentance has done its work, when forgiveness has been allowed to flow. In Acts 3, 19, it says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And again in the Amplified Bible, it says, So repent, change your inner self, your old way of thinking, regret past sins and return to God. Seek His purpose for your life so that your sins may be wiped away, blotted out, completely erased, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, restoring you like a cool wind on a hot day. Um, Brookie, can I get you to come? Is she here somewhere? Yep. <clears throat> all these scriptures, in all of these scriptures, I get this picture of the anointing, like a constantly flowing oil over our lives. It's not like the anointing is something that is stored up. It's not like this well of oil gathers on the inside of us and that's it and we just draw from that same place, that same anointing all the time. The anointing is the Holy Spirit. The anointing is the pre this, a precious aspect of the Spirit's enabling and empowering for good works, to fulfil the calling and destiny upon our lives, but also upon us together as the church. Even in Psalm 23, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, even today. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The fresh oil of anointing overflows. It bubbles over. Our cup runs over with His presence and His power. He isn't, he isn't static on the inside of us. He is free-flowing. He's the overflowing presence of the Holy Spirit. And how beautiful is that? How life-giving is that? How could we ever want one thing to hinder the, the freshness of His presence in our life? How could we ever want one thing to hinder the fre freshness of His presence in the life of the church? So let's prepare our hearts to pray, to receive, to be changed. We're going to ask God Himself to anoint us with fresh oil. See His hands smearing that oil all over your head, over your mind, over your heart. In fact, as it was with Aaron, over your whole being from head to toe. I ask you to remain seated for this because this is just a time to receive. And if you want, 
in some way, reach out, you know, place your hands out in front of you. The thing is that your heart is reaching out to God. Be expectant. Be revived. Be refreshed. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to come again, to pour yourself, your presence, your power upon us again this morning. We ask that you would pour out fresh oil, a fresh anointing upon each one of us sitting here this morning. That fresh oil, Lord God, be poured out upon us as the church together, that we would be one in heart and spirit together with no vision, no unity, but we would be unified by the presence and the power of God, by the blessing that comes, that you command to come upon your church. Holy Spirit, come. Flow over our minds. Renew our minds. Restore our minds. Those mindsets that we have had or those unbelief, those thoughts of doubt or that, you know, the complacency, the apathy that tries to sneak in. Lord, I pray that fresh oil would be poured upon our minds today, upon our hearts, revive our hearts. Lord God, those new mercies, that compassion that comes fresh every morning. Pour it out, Lord God, upon us upon your church this morning. Let a fresh anointing, Lord, come amongst us. Let the freshness of your Spirit, your fresh mercies, Lord God, be poured out this morning, today. Today, Lord God, is always the day of salvation. Today. Lord, let the, you know, the oil, the anointing, Lord God, is, is, an, is a, an oil of, of joy. It's an oil of, of gladness. And I pray, Lord God, for that joy and that gladness to come upon us this morning. As we reach out, Lord God, and, and our hearts reach out, our hands reach out, our whole body, soul, and spirit is surrendered to You. Lord, that You would pour out fresh anointing oil, that we would be overflowing, that we would be dripping, Lord God, with that the presence of God the presence and the power of God. Because Lord, Your anointing is empowering. Your anointing is strengthening. Strengthen us, Lord God. Empower us. Lord, to do all those things that You, Jesus, said about Yourself. You know that we are, we are here to heal the blind. We're here to you know, restore the brokenhearted. We're here to see people come running to salvation, running into your presence, not running to a church, not running to religion, but running to the presence of God, running into the arms of Jesus Christ, their Saviour, their Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Fill us afresh, Lord. Each one of us, right now, Lord, as we sit here, in some way, there's a burden that we carry. There is a yoke upon our shoulders. And I pray that that fresh anointing would break every yoke and break off every burden, that every chain would be broken in Jesus' Name. That You would lift off, Lord God, those things that don't belong to us that there would be such a sense of refreshing that comes right now, today. We are refreshed, we're renewed, we're restored. We are positioned to be the church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century. For all that is ahead, even the battles that are to come, that there would be a fresh anointing for each battle. There'd be a fresh anointing for every battle that comes within our own mind, in our own heart. Instead of apathy and complacency, there is life, there is joy. 
There is a Holy Spirit's presence. There's an expectancy. Our shield of faith is, is oiled and anointed for battle. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You put it all together. Your word is true. We surrender ourselves afresh, Lord. We give ourselves over to you. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In this life I live, I now live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As we worship, as we continue to worship right now, I pray, Lord God, that that anointing, fresh anointing oil would continue to flow over us. In Jesus' name. All my words fall short.